So this morning, we continue our series on finding our why. Last week, um, I talked about why the Bible was created in the first place, and that it's about connecting the stories of what God has done among God's people and how that connects with our present day life. Our Bible is not our God, but our Bible points us to who God is, what God is about, and helps us to connect with God today. For us as Christians, we specifically recognize that uh, um, our purpose for reading the Bible is to be inspired to follow Jesus more fully, Jesus being God in the flesh. And I give a challenge for each of us who are here to take a slip of paper that had a chapter of the Bible on it, to read that every day, and to actually write it out throughout the week. Um, I know that some of you did this, and for those that weren't here, if you'd still like to do that this following week, um, there's still some more out on the table in the back. But I was really encouraged to see all of these handwritten um, chapters of the Bible brought back today that, that we can enjoy as a congregation. And soon, um, you'll start to see how that will be used. I have some ideas, but I need to test them before, before reality um, kicks in. Um, so I hope this was a meaningful experience for those of you who participated. Um, I heard back from some that it was that new things were revealed or it really spoke to their life that week, that it just happened to be, and that's, that's really neat. Um, one thing I forgot to say, though, last week, because I was asking you to, to repeat something over and over again, I think sometimes we kind of have a bad attitude about repetition um, because we're very much geared on what's the new thing, um, moving from one thing to the next over and over. But it's really a good practice for us to kind of break that pattern and just repeat something over and over because like I said, people encountered new things in these scriptures, and sometimes it took two or three or four or even seven times reading through that same chapter to find something new, um, for God to speak to them in a new way. And I think this can be really powerful if we open ourselves to that possibility and not just shut down when we hear that we have to repeat something over and over. Um, and I think the Bible can be powerful, whether we read it once or we read it ten times. I think it becomes more powerful as we repeat it because it pushes up against a lot of the things we do take for granted. But I intentionally started with the Bible first in this series because I think it builds into a lot of the other topics that we'll cover. Today, why the church? From the Bible's perspective, from our experience, from our traditions, and from our discernment, why? Do we have church? Next week, why the gospel? Why is God's work that we read in the Bible and experience in our life today, why is that good news? And why should we share it? And the last Sunday in May, we'll focus on why do we have hope? Why do we have hope according to the Bible? And why is it important so very important that we live of God's, as God's people of hope today. In each of these, I think they're, they're kind of building on each other. And they, starting with scripture, now into church, who we are as a church builds into the gospel that we share, builds into the hope that we have. But I think in each of these, I'm probably going to come up against something maybe that you've heard or you've thought before. Um, and I hope that you will, you will not just shut down because I'm saying something different than maybe you've heard. Um, I did not grow up in the church. Um, I did not start attending church or becoming really active in church until I was um, 19 and into my 20s. And so in some ways that's, that can be an advantage in that I, I, didn't, I don't have to unlearn some things um, that maybe were taught to me. Um, I also have the disadvantage of I had a lot of catching up to do. Um, but I hope that you will take the time to listen, um, listen with curiosity, even as new or different things come up. And I invite you to fact check me, if you will. But I, I would hope that you would use good sources, like the scriptures, um, 
like um, resources we have in our church library and, and other good sources. And if you have questions, let me know. Um, I also plan to put together a book list for the, thing, the books that influenced me in preparing for these sermons that will appear in our next In Touch. Um, so specifically today, finding our why, why church? So when I say church, I'm talking about something bigger than just this worship service. I'm talking about all the things that make church. And, and mostly church, I think, refers to us as people, as a group. Um, it's who we are. It's our identity. It's our mission. And our mission as church is to love God, to love others, and to join God's work of reconciliation and of making disciples in our world. Another way we often say this very concisely is to say that we are blessed to be a blessing to our world. Um, hopefully we're not just hoarding that blessing for ourselves, but we are sharing that. But the reality or sometimes the question that we get um, that pushes up against the idea of being part of an assembled church like this today is, well, if the Holy Spirit dwells in each of us, who follow Jesus, who have confessed Jesus as our Lord and Savior, why do we even need church? Well, I think that ties back to what's our mission, what's our job as the church. Our church is, our job as a church is to love God and to love others and join in that reconciliation and making of disciples. But that's hard work. That's pushing up against everything that our world tells us we should do. Our world says that we should love ourselves, that we should take care of ourselves first. And if there's anything left over, maybe give it to others. Our faith challenges us to do the opposite, to take care of others first, not leaving ourselves destitute, but not focusing only on our own needs. And that's why we need each other. Because if we're focusing on the needs of somebody else, maybe somebody is focusing on our needs and we're partnering together to make sure that we are all cared for as part of the family of God. And so, kind of giving the punchline early, is that I think the church exists to be what the world cannot be, an other-serving family for all of God's broken and beloved people. I say broken and beloved here because I think this is kind of a contradiction that we're not very good at holding together. Oftentimes in our world, you are either broken or beloved. You're either, you're either seen as, as worth less or worth something. And I don't think that's, that's true. God is able to see both of these realities, that we're imperfect, but we're loved. I think families do this well also. When I think of my family, I think of who else can I roll my eyes at one minute and the next minute kiss goodnight? Who else but my family is willing to forgive, to console, or freely give their time to me and their resources, even when I'm a bit of a screw up? And who else will pick me up off the ground no matter how many times I fall and fail? but will also celebrate heartily with me when I succeed because they don't feel threatened, but instead feel encouraged. When I think of my family growing up, I always felt a lot of support from my family, and I realize that not everybody has this, and so that's why I hope that our church can be like a family. But I think of my parents and how they supported me. They showed up for the things that I was doing. They were a part of the different... Um, activities as volunteers or as, um, as chaperones. And even when I did things or was a part of stuff that they didn't necessarily agree with or appreciate, they were still there for me. They would come alongside me when I screwed up. They would show me that they loved me in the midst of whatever was going on. I think of them as giving support that was like a safe place to land at the end of the day, no matter what happened. And I hope that our church and all churches can be like that too. So let's take a minute to see how that plays out in our passage from Matthew 16 today. Um, 
The first thing I want to mention is the word church comes from the Greek ekklesia. I know I've already bored some of you, um, but this is who I am, so accept it. Um, <laughs> this is a word that, that more literally means a group assembled for a purpose. Um, this is a word that was used of many groups in the first century, but it, Jesus specifically applies it to the group of, of his followers that would be later called the church. And, and when I say group assembled for a purpose, um, there's not, there, it doesn't say who assembled this group, but typically when you're reading the Bible, if it doesn't say who did it, and it's not very obvious, it's usually because it's assumed that, or that you would assume that they're talking about God. So God assembles this group, but assembles it for a purpose. And I think that purpose is that whole blessed to be a blessing. So, we have three pieces of this scripture that I want to get into that I think offer three sort of challenges that I see in our world, um, and, but also three opportunities of a, of a different way that we could engage this text and learn from it. So in this first part, as we heard, Jesus asks, who do you say I am? Peter says, you're the Messiah. And, and then Jesus responds with, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and so on. I think often we focus a lot on, on Peter and these keys in this, in this passage. But I think it would be better, actually, if we, if we focused a little differently. Because if we focus on a person in history and an action in history, I think we can start to think of the Bible, of church, of faith, as something more like a museum. Something that happened back then, something that we can appreciate today, but what does it even mean for us? When I, when I think about this, I want to focus more on, on what Peter said and what Peter represents in saying that. Peter represents a person confessing faith in Jesus. Now that faith being a change in belief and action, it's active, it's here and now. It's not stuck in the past, it's not just about Peter, it's about our ministry and our lives and our faith today. In essence, we make daily, maybe even hourly, maybe even every minute choices to follow Jesus in what we say and what we do. And the church is the place where we can begin to work that out, that we can practice it, that we can have support when that's a tough thing to do. The next part of this passage, Jesus begins to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering, be killed, and then on the third day be raised. And then, of course, we know that Peter takes him aside, and of course, this is Peter going backwards on himself, as he sometimes does. Peter gets a really bad rap in some of these <laughs> gospel stories, and I feel bad for him sometimes, um, but I also recognize that I'm like Peter sometimes, um, and we all can be. Peter was thinking about a Messiah in a different way than Jesus was living and breathing as the Messiah. And too often we do this with church. We think of church as somebody that's going to provide the services that we desire. Like Peter, who had a vision for, for a Messiah that would give him power, military security, and, and prosperity. We sometimes think of church as something that's going to give us things. Maybe put us in a special position. Make us feel really good about ourselves. But just as, just as Jesus shut down Peter in this idea of a service provider we need to also shut down this idea that our church is here to serve us. Instead of focusing on just what the church can do for us, we are called to the same kind of self-giving that Jesus embodied. The church is a place where we can practice humility, practice vulnerability, and practice the trusting in God and God's people that will help us to live this very difficult call 
Jesus continues, if you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will I profit or what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? I think all churches struggle with this, this kind of back and forth at some point in their life, and oftentimes repeatedly. There's kind of a stra- uh, this, this struggle or trap of becoming very inwardly focused. We focus on our own desires for maybe how, how worship should be or what color the paint or the carpet should be or who can do what and who can't or how people should act or how people should dress or what have you. Again, losing track of our calling to love God, to love others, to make disciples. And when we do that, I think we, in some ways, cease to be the church. We become something else. And research shows that the more inwardly focused a church becomes, the less it lives out its mission and the closer it is to closing its doors. A repeated theme in both the Old and the New Testament is that when the people of God become inwardly focused, it results in trouble. Last week, I talked about how a lot of the Bible came together as the people of God were in exile in Babylon. That exile happened because the people were so inwardly focused that they left their mission of being blessed to be a blessing behind. And so God put them in a place where they had to learn a new way. And so if we are blessed to be a blessing, we can't hoard it. We have to continue to find ways to spread it, to share it, to be open to new ideas, to be open to doing things in the same way, but maybe a little different, to be open to new people serving in new places, If we are always asking, what do I get out of church? I think we're falling into that trap. Rather, maybe we can ask, how can I serve? Or how can we as a church serve our community? And so we have the church, a place where Well, I should rephrase that. It's not a place. It's a community that was created of those who are confessing their faith in God and can then come together to support each other as we live out that faith. Ultimately, we are naturally geared towards self-preservation. But my hope would be that we would take the risk of loving others because of the support that we can find in our church family. Again, the church exists to be what the world cannot be, an other-serving family for all of God's broken and beloved people. The people gathered here today, the people across the street, the people around the world. But the church is meaningless if we are not those things. And so in a book that I listened to this week, um, the author, who is a pastor, a writer, actually written about 25 books, um, Tom Rayner, who I don't necessarily agree with on everything, but found this idea of shifting from I want to I will as a really powerful image. To show how this works, I want to first tell a story that comes from the book entitled I Will. He talks of a woman named Heather who is fed up with churches that act more like a country club than a church, where people just pay their dues or give their offering so that they can get what they want out of church. After visiting several churches, 
Heather visits with a pastor and his wife and presents a list of what's wrong with the churches that she's been visiting. In response to this list, the pastor's wife, in great wisdom, affirms the list, saying, yes, these are things that we as a church and many other churches could work on. But maybe you've been looking at church the wrong way. Maybe you should, ask, you should not be asking what you can get out of church, but how God would have you serve in a church. Instead of saying, I want, start saying, I will. The meeting between the pastors and pastor's wife and this woman, Heather, ended, and Heather went home with kind of that, that phrase rattling in her head. And she was kind of upset by it. She couldn't figure out why, though, until she was lying in bed that night trying to get to sleep and realize that the very comment that was said to her was the same thing that she hated about all these other churches that were acting like country clubs. She had the perspective of thinking of church as a place that provided what she wanted. From that day forth, she chose to be an I will Christian, an I will church member. She joined the church and became a servant rather than a consumer. So what does this look like, though, for us? Many of us are part of this church and serve um, in different ways. Some of us struggle to know how we can serve, how we can be a part of this church in a meaningful way. And I hope some of you are already beginning to think, how can I shift from being I want to I will? I think this comes by taking responsibility for ourselves and our part in not viewing church through a lens of personal satisfaction. We are a body of many preferences, of many desires, and many different wants. In any given worship service, program, what have you, we can't keep everyone happy all the time. And I don't think that should be our goal either, because if that is, we might as well become a country club. So I want to highlight six areas that come from this book, I Will, by Tom Rainer, that help to focus our I will statements. The first, I will worship with others. Worshiping together has a profound impact. And while we don't always maybe appreciate every moment in a service, we can maybe appreciate that somebody else in that service does, that somebody is being challenged or spoken to or encouraged in that moment. Just showing up is a pretty big deal. And so we say, I will attend worship services. I think another reality that will help us that I heard in this book was to pray. Pray before attending worship services. Pray for our attitude. Pray that we will hear from God and be open to what we hear. Pray for others that will be here. And pray that we will enter as worshipers, not judges. We can say, I will grow together with others. In his book, he actually said that People who are connected in smaller groups within a church are five times more likely to stay connected and feel connected to a church. And so he suggested, and, and I would echo this thought, that it's very important to be a part of some kind of small group as part of this church. As you know, we're in a, in a decently large sanctuary that actually could seat over 600 people. And I often sit over here. I have an idea because I stand up here who sits over there, but don't often get to visit. A small group provides an opportunity where we can visit. Now that could be a Sunday school class. It could be a triad. Triads are great opportunities to really get to know three people or two other people. Um, and then hopefully that triad would grow, build and grow. Um, into more triads as time goes on. 
Um, you might have a group that you get together for lunch or for coffee. And you connect over spiritual realities. You connect over your faith. You pray for each other. You hold each other accountable. I think this is a, a way that we can be committed not only to one another, but to the, the mission that we have as a church. We can say, I will serve. Now, this is a hand not open to take, like gimme. It's a hand open offering something. There is no age requirement or age limit on serving. In fact, one of, one of the challenges in this book was to take two hours per week or two more hours per week if you're already serving in some ways and think of ways that you might serve others in those two hours. Maybe it's reading to children. Maybe if you're a child, it's writing encouragement cards. Maybe if you're bound to your home, it's writing letters or calling somebody with a word of encouragement. Another commitment is I will go. And this is about sharing our faith, sharing how our experience and walk with God has impacted and changed our lives. I honestly think this is something that we as Mennonites struggle with a lot because we don't want to impose. We want to keep the peace. And one way to do that is to not ruffle any feathers. But in another book by the same author, the majority of people in, our, in, in this nation, 95%, are at least somewhat open to hearing you share about your faith, all the way up to a great majority being very interested to hear your faith story. To be interested, to be invited into the small groups, small groups often being much less um, sort of imposing than maybe coming into a church. But I'm going to talk more about this next week, so I'll leave that for now. Fifth thing, I will give generously. Um, and there are a lot of very generous givers in this congregation. I mean, from what I see, the very limited picture that I see of, of what people give, but I think it's important to say that we have to plan to give. Um, one example, and I'll give my own example, when I was looking to buy a house and try to figure out how much I could afford and, and, and factor all that in, before I looked at my income and looked at the other things that I had, I said, how much am I going to give generously? I'm not trying to say that I am perfect or I am a saint, um, but this is a practice and a plan and a way that I've found helpful when it comes to planning my finances to say, I'm going to give away this much. And saying that first, so it's not like, oh, what do I have left at the end to be generous with? Plan to give. Plan to increase that giving over time. Because it can become kind of just a habit. And really, the important reason why we give is not just so that we can keep a facility and keep me employed, although I do appreciate that. It's because we need to break our obsession and our worship of money and things. And so offering to the church, giving to charities, is a way that we can release that. That we can acknowledge that everything that we have is, just, is, is owned by God, but we are stewards of it. The last one, I will not be a church dropout. We've had some tough times, and there are times when maybe we need a break. But I think, and I've, I've been very encouraged by those who have and continue to remain committed to this congregation. No congregation is every, ever perfect. And frankly, I'm pretty sure if you haven't been um, at least a little burned by a person in this church, it's, it might be coming. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but if we are a family, 
if we learn to love each other, we can also learn to forgive each other. Because we are imperfect. And those moments come. I know that my family at times can be my greatest ally. They can also at moments be my greatest enemy because there's such deep love that we share that even the smallest of criticisms can feel like a hard one. But being committed, saying, I will remain, I think can be really powerful. It can be really transformative, not only for our church body, but for us ourselves, to not always be seeking comfort, to not always be seeking what we can get, but instead saying, I will give. As we head into our time of reflection, I invite each of us to consider making a commitment, making an I will commitment. You don't have to write it on the wall or say it out loud, although it might be good to share it with someone or a small group of persons that you connect with. And if you're struggling to think of something, maybe look back on the chapter of scripture that you read this past week, or another um, experience that you've had maybe in a Sunday school class, or just what you've heard from the scripture today. What is it challenging you to say, I will to, instead of saying, I want?